We now reach Meditation 4. And in Meditation 4, the tables have turned. Right? Meditation 1 started with Descartes getting us into this state of universal doubt. Right? Everything was doubtful. It was hard to understand how we human beings could have any knowledge at all. How we could ever be right about anything. Um, you know, that's sort of something that, that we might despair about at the end of Meditation 1. Alright, but Meditation 2 has proved to us the existence of ourselves and of the contents of our minds. Meditation 3 has proved the existence of a God who creates and sustains us us and has shown that this God is no deceiver, that this God is good and perfect. What does that mean? Well, here in Meditation 4, Descartes realizes, and once again, this is one of these moments where I think, yeah, where, where we have to be impressed by how thorough Descartes is in, in working out the results of his own thinking. Descartes realizes that in solving this sort of problem of, of skepticism, he has created the opposite problem. Let's read on. He writes, To begin with, I acknowledge that it is impossible for God ever to deceive me, for trickery or deception are always indicative of some imperfection. And although the ability to deceive seems to be an indication of cleverness or power, the will to deceive undoubtedly attests to maliciousness or weakness. Accordingly, deception is incompatible with God. Next, I experience that there is in me a certain faculty of judgment, which, like everything else that is in me, I undoubtedly received from God. And since he does not wish to deceive me, he assuredly has not given me the sort of faculty with which I could ever make a mistake when I use it properly, right? If God is good, then the faculties, the abilities he gives to me will be such that if I use them properly, I will never be able to make a mistake. Because if, if they did enable me, I mean, if, if even if I used them properly, I might turn out to be mistaken, that would seem to be a pretty imperfect design on God's part, indicative of either maliciousness or weakness or, you know, something that, that, that makes God not do what he ought to have done. But of course that's impossible. So he has given me the sort of faculty with which I could never make a mistake as long as I use it properly. And then Descartes adds this. He says, no doubt regarding this matter would remain, but for the fact that it seems to follow from this that I am never capable of making a mistake. So what Descartes realizes is that it seems that he has proven too much, right? If God has created us, if God, the perfect creator, has created us, um, willing, uh, willing, never willing to deceive us, then how is it possible that we are ever wrong? But of course we are wrong all the time. Well, not all the time, but a lot of the time. How is this possible? Right? The question of the first meditations, how is any knowledge possible at all, has been replaced here by the question of how is failing to know anything, how is a mistake possible at all? And that's what Descartes is going to try to confront here. Although this may sound like a, a, a strange problem, how is it possible for humans to make mistakes, what we in fact are going to see is that Descartes grapples here with one of the oldest problems of theology, uh, and, and, theological and theological philosophy, the problem of evil. Right? If God is good, if God is perfect, then how can it be the case that there is evil in the world? Right? How can that happen if the world was created by a good God? How can there be evil? That is really the question that Descartes is asking, specifically in the realm of knowledge, but we're going to see that, that his answers will be very much like the traditional answers or some of the traditional answers to the problem of evil. Right? Descartes is wondering how there could be epistemic evil in the sense of failures to know, failed judgments, mistakes. How can that exist if we have been created by a good and powerful God? 
So maybe it's good to, to, before we look at Descartes, say something about the most famous, I would say, most influential um, solution to the problem of evil in the Western tradition. It's, a, um, it's an idea that we can find in the ancient Neoplatonists that was taken up by Augustine and that has been working throughout Western thought you know, since antiquity and uh, was definitely known to Descartes. It is the idea that evil doesn't exist in a very specific way that I'm going to explain. Right? You might think that, oh, there's lots of evil and imperfection in the world. Right? Everywhere I look around me, I see evil and imperfection. And that's not something that, that people like, uh, oh, I don't know, Plotinus or, or Augustine or whomever would disagree with. What they would disagree with is the idea that this evil or imperfection is really something that exists, that has being. Rather, what they would suggest is that evil is like darkness. Darkness doesn't have any existence of its own. It is merely the non-existence or the non-presence of light. In the same way, evil is supposed to be something that doesn't really exist. It is merely the non-presence, non-existence of good. Or, according to some of these authors, maybe the more metaphysically rigorous ones, uh, it is non-existence as such. Evil and, and non-existence are, in a sense, the same. If I'm imperfect, that is because I don't fully embody what it is to be a human being in all its, its glory and perfection. And what is lacking in me is not, is really just a lack, right? There's no substance that is evil in me. I just lack some goodness. Um, this is going to turn out to be more or less the way that, that Descartes is going to explain what, what happens. Okay, let's look at, at the way that Descartes sets this up. Well, he says, okay, um... Basically, he's going to, to give us this answer immediately. He says, Insofar as I have been created by the Supreme Being, there is nothing in me by means of which I might be deceived or be led into error. Right? Insofar as I come from God, I can't be wrong. But, insofar as I participate in nothingness or non-being, that is, insofar as I am not the Supreme Being and lack a great many things, it is not surprising that I make mistakes, right? So Descartes is suggesting that I'm, I'm a finite substance. I lack a lot of things. I don't have everything that would belong to a, a real supreme being, somebody at the top of the ontological hierarchy. And so it's not surprising that I'm imperfect and that I might be making mistakes. Well, says Descartes, maybe this is a bit too quick. And then he goes on to say this. This is not yet altogether satisfactory, for error is not a pure negation, but rather a privation or a lack of some knowledge that somehow ought to be in me. So now Descartes is going to say that, look, just the fact that I, I am not something is by itself not an imperfection, right? I don't have everything. Okay, I don't know exactly how many stars there are in the universe. Yeah, I'm a finite intelligence. I can't look throughout the entire universe. I, I don't have that knowledge. But by itself, that's not error, right? It's only error when I stand there and say, there are exactly 15 million stars in the universe. And I'm wrong. And I, I would be massively wrong if I said that. Um, that is error. So in error, something is, is really going wrong. It's not just that I lack some knowledge, but something is really going wrong. And I need to understand that, right? Merely pointing out that I'm finite, that I lack some things, might explain why I don't know everything, but it doesn't really explain why I ever get into error. So how do I find out that I ever get into error? Okay. Now, Descartes gives us a brief aside that I do want to say a little bit about because it's so interesting for his, um, his physics, his philosophy of nature. Uh, he says that, you know, of course, I don't really understand God very well. 
I don't know why God does the kinds of things that God does. Um, my nature is very weak and limited, whereas the nature of God is immense, incomprehensible and infinite. Um, and this is sufficient for me to also know that he can make innumerable things whose causes escape me. So I, I, I really can't hope to understand everything that God does, right? I mean, he's so far above me. And then Descartes adds this seemingly innocuous, but really barbed and pointed line. He says, for this reason alone, the entire class of causes which people customarily derive from a thing's end, I judge to be utterly useless in physics. It is not without rashness that I think myself capable of inquiring into the ends of God. So here really what Descartes is saying is, we don't know exactly why God does things, what ends, he, what goals he has in mind. And that means that if we try to understand the world in terms of goals, in terms of ends, we are being rash, we are being impious, we are, um, we are trying to read God's mind even though we know that we can't do that, and we shouldn't do that. And this is really important because one of the fundamental features of Aristotelian science, the kind of science that Descartes is going to reject, is that it describes the world in terms of ends, that it describes the world in terms of what things are for, what they strive towards, as we're going to see in our lecture on uh, on the new science. So this is really a, a, a little bit of the meditations that Descartes puts in just to make a quick attack on Aristotle and then, you know, go back to his real topic, which is the possibility of error. Now, in order to better understand error, Descartes says, we should understand how I make a judgment, right? In Meditation 3, Descartes has explained to us that true and false really only apply to judgments. A judgment is not merely an idea, right? Maybe I have the idea of purple cows grazing in a mountainous meadow. There's nothing false about that, right? I mean, I just have this idea. I see it in front of me, whatever. I, I think about it. It's only when I say, oh, this is real. This exists. Um, those Milka TV spots are really true. Um, it's only when I say that, that I make an error. So error, truth and falsity and, and error are only possible in a judgment. And a judgment is when I take an idea and I either affirm it and say, yes, this is how things are, or deny it and say, no, this is not how things are, right? That's when I can be in error. And now Descartes is going to say that in doing this, there are there are two faculties of the mind involved. There's the intellect and there is the will. The intellect gives us the idea and the will then affirms or denies, right? So we have a two-step and two-faculty story of how judgment works. The intellect gives me an idea and then the will either says yes or no or nothing. We could also suspend judgment. In many ways, this is a very problematic story. It's a very problematic story, um, in part because how is the will going to say yes or no? Right? I mean, that seems to be something that ought to depend on what the intellect or the understanding is telling us. Uh, and so it seems that in the intellect or the understanding, there already ought to be a sort of direction of saying yes or no, which according to Descartes isn't in the understanding, but is in the will. Um, and trying to work this out, trying to, to really understand what Descartes is saying here and whether he's saying the same thing in all texts and so on and so forth is, is uh, really a very, a very complicated issue. Um, but for now, I, I really want to take this, this model like seriously. There's the intellect and the will, and let's see how Descartes uses it to explain error. Well, he says, um, the understanding itself can't really be, be wrong right? It is, it is limited. Maybe I can't really understand everything in a way that, that God understands it, right? Already, maybe, even if I just think about mental images, my limitations are pretty clear. I might be able to imagine a triangle. I have a lot of difficulty imagining an 11-angle figure, 
and a thousand angled figure well you know there's there's no way there's no way that I could possibly do that um, but you know in itself the understanding limited or not it's just giving me ideas and it, it can never make a mistake right the mistake is only when I assent or deny it so maybe for the mistake I will have to look to the will now did God give me in some way an imperfect will no Descartes says I can't complain that the will is insufficiently ample or perfect since I experience that it is limited by no boundaries whatever. In fact, it seems to be especially worth noting that no other things in me are so perfect or so great, but that I understand that it can still be more perfect or more great. Um, so he says, look, everything I have, like maybe my physical strength, but you know, even like mental things like my understanding, it's super clear to me how my understanding could be greater um, than it is, right? I could be able to, to understand things more quickly or I could uh, understand things uh, that I can't really understand now. This is where, you know, the kids are going to run into my room and you're going to see them in the background. Um, ah. <laughs> but the will, Descartes says, which is this faculty of saying yes or no, you either have it or you don't have it. Right? You either have it, and you can say yes or no to things freely, or you don't have it, and you are not a free human being. Right? Um, we're missing nothing in our will. Our will isn't imperfect. It can't be imperfect. Descartes goes as far as to say that our ability to choose is just the same as God's. That God's will isn't greater than our will. God's understanding is greater and God's power is greater. And so there are many more things that God could will and there are many more things that God could then actually do. Um, everything. But the very faculty of saying yes or no, of assenting or denying, we just have it in the same way that God has it. But that leaves Descartes in a bit of a conundrum, right? I perceive that the power of willing, which I got from God, is not taken by itself the cause of my errors, for it is most ample and perfect in its kind. Nor is my power of understanding the cause of my errors, for since I got my power of understanding from God, whatever I understand, I doubtless understand rightly, and it is impossible for me to be deceived in this. What then is the source of my errors? Well, they are owing simply to the fact that since the will extends further than the intellect, I do not contain the will within the same boundaries. Rather, I also extend it to things I do not understand. Because the will is indifferent in regard to such matters, it easily turns away from the true and the good, and in this way I am deceived and I sin. So being deceived and sinning turn out to be the same thing here on the on the level of, of thought, on the level, level of thinking. Um, so what Descartes is saying is this. He says, look, there are certain things that you properly understand. Um, so you understand whether they're, whether they're false or true. And when you use the will there, you're going to do things right every single time. You're going to say yes to the things that are right and no to the things that are false. And see here how already, right, the, the trouble that I spoke about earlier is, is creeping up because it really seems that the understanding itself has to show us what is true and what is false. And then the will says yes or no, but, but what is the will really doing there, right? If the understanding shows me that something is true, what, what do I need the will for? But okay, I mean, again, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that aside. So let's take Descartes' model. Um, but there are also lots of things that I don't understand very well. And nevertheless, I can apply the will to it and affirm things and deny things. And when I do so, that's when I can, I can make true judgments, but I can also make false judgments. That's where error is possible. And this is sin. It is sin because I am misusing 
the gifts that have been given me by God. Right? God has given me the will in order to say yes to things that are true and no to things that are false. When I'm using the will to say yes and no to things that I, I shouldn't say anything about, that I should just be agnostic about because I don't see whether they are true or false, I am misusing this gift of God and that could properly be called sinning. Um, and so being wrong for Descartes is in a sense a moral failure. Right? If you are wrong, that is because you rashly judged where you oughtn't to have judged. Because you ought to judge only where you can't be wrong, where you can see what is true and what is false. So, so that is the core, right? The core of, of Descartes, uh, Descartes' story. And it also means that we can avoid error. I can avoid error um, in the other way, which depends solely on my remembering to abstain from making judgments whenever the truth of a given matter is not apparent. Uh, and let me just add here for a moment, uh, for those who, who like this kind of thing, that Descartes' discussion here of judgment is a lot like the discussion of the Stoics, like already in, in, in ancient uh, Greece and Rome. Um, the Stoics would say that the wise man is never wrong. The wise man is never wrong because the wise man can make a distinction between impressions that are clearly true and impressions for which it's not clear whether they're true. And the wise man will only affirm in his judgment the things that are clearly true, the impressions that are clearly true. Um, and so the wise man for the Stoics is somebody who, who does what Descartes tells us we should do. Right? We should not assent to anything unless we really clearly see that it's true and then we say yes and if that's what we do we can never be wrong one of the discussions that the stoics get into all the time is whether the wise man could ever assent to anything or whether he has to withhold judgment to everything where descartes in a sense improves on the stoics um at least from this particular point of view is that he has given us already several meditations worth of, you know, things that we can assent to, that we can't be wrong about. So, there's that. Let us not skip over something that Descartes tells us at the very, very end of the fourth meditation. I'll just maybe read out the entire last paragraph. Since herein lies the greatest and chief perfection of man getting to knowledge, not erring, I think today's meditation, in which I investigated the cause of error and falsity, was quite profitable. Nor can this cause be anything other than the one I have described. For as often as I restrain my will when I make judgments, so that it extends only to those matters that the intellect clearly and distinctly discloses to it, it plainly cannot happen that I err. For every clear and distinct perception is surely something, and hence it cannot come from nothing. On the contrary, it must necessarily have God for its author. God, I say, that supremely perfect being to whom it is repugnant to be a deceiver. Therefore, the perception is most assuredly true. What the Stoics had to do, if they wanted to say that there were these impressions that we could be sure about, um, and the Stoics were, in a sense, probably thinking about sense impressions in a way that Descartes is not, um, is they, they, they needed to give some kind of mark, some kind of criterion, by which the sage, the wise man, could distinguish the real, true, veritable impression from all the other false and misleading ones. And this, of course, turned out to be very, very hard. Descartes thinks he has it, right? The real, true thought is the one that is clearly distinct, clear and distinct, the one that is vivid in all of its aspects, that we can totally see, right? That is, in a sense, transparent to us, that we can just completely grasp. And Descartes believes that if you can completely grasp something, then you immediately know whether it's true or false. And now Descartes tells us that these are things we can't be deceived in, because 
such a clear and distinct perception is something, right? It has being, it has reality. Of all the perceptions, of all the thoughts we ever have, these, Descartes seems to be saying, are the ones that have, if anything, most reality, right? And that means that they can't be infected by evil. That means that they have to be coming from the source of all being, which is God. So I don't know whether there's, there's really a, a sort of a, a strict argument here, but I think it does help us to see how Descartes' entire system fits together, right? How even the idea of a clear and distinct perception hangs together with his ontological hierarchy and his ideas about God. Right? A clear and distinct perception, the kind of thing, the kind of thought of which I can immediately know that it's true is at the same time the kind of thought where it is clear that it has the most being, right? That it must come from the source of being and is not in any way infected by lack or deprivation. Because this clear and distinct, or as our other translator tells us, vivid and clear, um, what this means is that, you know, we can, we can grasp it. It is, it is in that sense clear or, or vivid, but we can also grasp every aspect of it. Right? So every little detail of our thought is entirely transparent and clear to us. And that means that, that no non-being, no vagueness, no lack can be hiding anywhere in it. Um, and so when I have this kind of thought, and only when I have this kind of thought, can I know that, wow, there's no wrongness hiding here. It's not the case that when I sort of try to analyze it further or explain it further, I will get to something that turns out to be unclear um, or illusory. No, this is just really true. That's why I can affirm it. Um, and these are the means, really, by which God gets into our, our, our thought, into our mind, um, puts the truth there, and allows us to get at all the other truths that we need. Uh, so that, in brief, I would say, is Descartes' model of knowledge and cognition and the philosophical and theological surroundings of that model.